Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of JA's Recipe for Success. I don't know about you, but I have been cooking up some amazing stuff, and today we are going to cook up some great conversation one of our with one of our communities, uh, new, uh, well, not really new, uh, but one of our leaders who uh, recently has been breaking some barriers in his own right. So I am just so thrilled this morning. You know, I love doing the show because I get to learn about people that I might not know that well, people that I've never met before. And then, of course, learn something more about the people that I do know in the community already. And so today is one of those opportunities for me to get to know someone better. And so this morning, our guest is David Koenig, Dave, I'll call him, right, who is with Co-America. He is the uh, retail, he was or is the retail district manager and Florida market president. He has been in banking for 35 years, and we are going to talk about all of that today and what his ingredients to success. Hi, Dave, and welcome to Recipe for Success. Hey, good morning, Lori. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, I, you know, we've been working on getting you on here for a little while. Our friend Mo Corker, immediately when you were um, promoted and, and put in your new position, which we'll talk a little bit about, said, you've got to have Dave on the show. And so I said, if Mo Corker tells me I got to do it, we got to do it, right? <laughs> so, right. Um, but I, it has been a pleasure. I know we got to see a video of you for one of our programs for Girls Rule, which you all are passionate about. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the community, right? And Co-American, how you're involved. Uh, Cause I definitely see a shift since you have uh, taken over the lead here in South Florida uh, in the community area as well. But I want to start with giving our viewers a chance to hear just a little bit about you. Um, one of the things that you shared and was in your bio is that you have been in banking for 35 years, right? And so I always want to know, especially in our organization, working with young people, helping them to find that path. How did you find your path into banking? Yeah, no, thanks, Lori. So um, I'm originally from Chicago. The majority of my career is there. And, you know, I knew from the get go that finance and banking was something I wanted to get into, but I wasn't really sure how to do it. And so, you know, I, I started, I went to college and after a couple of years of college, um, I went to the University of Iowa and Big Ten school. And after two years, it's like, you know what? I don't know if college is for me. Um, I wasn't doing very well. So I came back home to Chicago and I got a job working as a teller in a bank. And so that gave me the opportunity to see if it's something that I enjoy doing, if I have a passion for, if I like it. Um, and so I worked as a teller in the bank. And then from there, actually, I worked in the trust department at the bank as well. But I knew having worked at the bank, for me to continue my career, I really needed to have my college education and my undergraduate degree. And so I went back to school. I went back to University of Iowa and I was really focused on finishing my education, getting my degree, and then from there moving back into the career world, back into banking. So um, that's how I kind of got into banking, um, kind of trial and error. And then, um, you know, working at um, a few different banks in Chicago mainly. Um, and I think over the 35 years, what I've been able to pull out is that it's not always important to get promoted to that next position. But one of my managers or bosses said, we really need you to learn other lines of business. And so I had the opportunity, not just, you know, being a teller and getting promoted to a, an assistant manager and then a branch manager, then a district manager but I was a director of training and development for the bank. I was in charge of their investment program. Um, I did wealth management, um, commercial lending. So it, it gave me a really a broad sense of banking and all different lines of businesses to eventually get to where I am today um, as the market president here in Florida, um, having that exposure to a lot of different lines of businesses. So um, I really truly love what I do. I have a passion for it. Um, and that's that's where I am today. 
Yeah. I mean, first of all, the passion, got to have the passion for whatever you do, right? <clears throat> or it can be a very miserable uh, way to live, right? And work. And so I'm a firm believer in that. I love your story. And it's really interesting because, uh, see, this is what I love about getting to know people is that there's a lot of similarities in your journey uh, as there are in mine. And I, you know, I shared with you that I kind of felt the same way. I had two parents in education. I went to college because that was what right, we were going to do. Um, and I always worked along the way and I worked in banks like you as a teller on a Saturday or whatever. Um, and just, uh, you know, I was doing okay at school, but I just, I was, I'm a hands-on mm -hmm. learner, doer, right? Um, and so I quit school college with 18 credits to finish and went to work for a big advertising agency, you know, like you move sideways, move upwards, right? All different moves, learned a lot of different things and then became a VP and realized, so after 10, 11 years, what if I ever want to leave here? All of the jobs that I would go for require a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. And so I finished at night while I was working uh, like you to make sure that I got it. But I love this because our students need to hear that, right? They look at us today and they think that we popped out as a success, right? right. Well, we didn't. Um, and with all of that, you know, talk about a little bit for me because that I love your journey. But there's lots of things that go along with that journey. There's fear, there's apprehension. Uh, there's, you know, uh, do I go out of my comfort zone? Do I not go out of my comfort zone? Like you talked about trying different things by trial and error. Well, that can be scary. I might fail. You know, talk a little bit about that. And even today, how that, because we all have that, right? Yep. I, want, I want our kids to know we all have that. That's right? right. I just had a conversation with my staff yesterday and said, we all think about that. We all have fear and experience fear and trepidation at times uh, in our careers, in our lives. So talk a little bit about that because I want them to hear about that. Yeah, no, that that's so true. And I, I think it's important for you to break out of your comfort zone, take some some risks, some calcul calculated risks in your career. And but I think you also have to have the drive and, and um, the focus on what you're doing to be successful. And so I'm just going to go back a little bit in my earlier on in my career. So I was in a management trainee program in the bank and it was a 15 or 16 month program. I finished it in five months because I knew this is what I wanted to do and I wanted to continue to grow. And so that was the first thing where I said, you know what, I'm going to take it upon myself to work extremely hard, put in what I want out of it and was able to move up from there. Fast forward to when I was a district manager in my first bank, um, I had been doing that for quite a few years and I reported to the president of the bank in Chicago. And he said to me, Dave, what do you wanna do next in your career? And I remember this, I, I, said, I, I said, you know, I wanna do anything except training and development. I don't have a comfort zone in training. I really don't want to do that. Anything but training. Well, two weeks later, he tapped me on the shoulder and says, guess what? You're going to be the tr director of training and development for the whole country for the bank. Truly out of my comfort zone. I had no experience. I didn't even know what to expect. And so, but I will tell you, you know, going into into that type of role that you you don't feel comfortable, um, it, it doesn't feel right at first. If I didn't have that role, I probably wouldn't be where I am today. Because as a director of training and development, I manage all the training managers across the country. I was able to do some stand up training to executives and a lot of facilitation. If I didn't have that skill set in early on in my career, I wouldn't have had the success that I've had throughout my career. So when I reflect back, that was probably the best uncomfortable opportunity um, early on in my career. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of gives you a little bit. Yeah. Of and you mentioned something in there that I think is so important. And I think that sometimes we don't always appreciate it when we have it which mm -hmm. is that mentor 
or that person that sees something, right? Yeah. Or knows we have the ability and the skills, but we might not challenge ourselves or push ourselves into that box, right? Because you, like you said, it's uncomfortable, but they see it and they push you out. And you might not like them very much when they do it, right? No. You might go, well, why is this person doing this to me, mm -hmm. right? Um, I had a woman who was the same way and boy, the names we called her. <laughs> um, but I will tell you, it's because of her that I am where I am today. Same, same thing. So I would really encourage our young people, especially, uh, or even our, our managers today, right? Sometimes there's someone who's pushing you and you may not like it. And you may think, why are they pushing me? Right? Why are they making me do these things? Because they see something yes. in us that maybe we don't always see in ourselves. And yes. I think that's so important. I, I, for me, it was absolutely one of the key essential ingredients uh, in my career. Because if she had not done that, I don't know where I would be. Yeah. And, they, you know, and then really moving forward, you know, I'm not going to go through my whole career, but towards the, the end, kind of my last position in Chicago, I worked for a large bank. I was a market manager and then was promoted to a market executive. I was responsible for about a hundred branches across the Chicago area. And my manager um, was, I, I reflect back, he was probably the best manager I ever had, probably most instrumental in my career and where I am today. But he was very, very hard on you. He pushed you for a reason. He made you feel uncomfortable every time you had to present to him your business plan or your results. And we used to have to get, we went in front of him every month, my team and I, to present our monthly results and our, our plan for the following month. And I will tell you, we were very nervous, scared going in, coming out of it like, phew, that's over. But when you reflect back, it was, I still say today, he was probably the best boss or manager I've ever had in my career. Um, yes. And I still stay in contact with him. I mean, just amazing. And you know, there, I, I think in your career too, there are some managers or bosses that you learn different things from and you take yes. them from that. And there's some that you say, hmm, what I'm learning from this manager, I'm not going to take with me because I don't feel right about it. I, I saw how it impacted other people. And so you learn from that. So you learn some of the, the positives and you learn some of the not so positives that you want to take and make your own as you continue to grow as a leader. Yeah. And it's interesting. You know, I think um, the woman that I mentioned earlier was not always the most respectful person. Mm -hmm. And I did learn that, that I never wanted to make someone feel horrible like that, right? You, you can push people. People are not going to like that, right? And they're right. going to say, oh, why is she pushing me? And I always try to explain if I was, if I'm not pushing you, mm -hmm. exactly. that's not a good thing, right? No. Because I, then I obviously think you're just doing what you can do and, and that's okay, by the way. Um, right. But if I think there's more in there, then I think we have a responsibility as leaders to push them. And sometimes that comes off as, oh, I don't like that. I don't want to be that kind of manager, right? I don't want to be pushy. But there's a difference between that and being abusive or disrespectful, right? Or unprofessional. And I think there's finding that fine line sometimes because now you're managing so many mm -hmm. people, right? So talk a little bit about that because you manage how many people are in your Florida region that you cover? So I, I, I directly responsible for the banking centers, all the retail banking centers in Florida. We have seven of those, um, but oversee all the lines of business as well, even though they don't have a direct report to me. So we have close to 90 to 100 employees in Florida, all lines of business. And so really try to make sure that we all work together cohesively. We collaborate together. We partner together. Um, but I will share with you that my direct reports you know, I think when you when you try to push them because you see the potential in them, you see a long runway of opportunity for them in their career. And, and so I think it's a matter of not just telling them what they need to do, but helping them and show them how to do it. 
you know, here's how to be successful. I need you to work on this project, but let me show you how to do it. I will lead you along the way, but I said, you need to take the ball and run with it. Um, and, and you have to have, I think the other thing, my success has always been having that emotional connection with the employees that you work with. Cause I think that's so critical to your success as a leader. If you don't have that emotional connection, you will not be successful. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I reflect back as well, when, when I walk into a banking center, into a bank, normally it's the manager that reports to me, but I make an effort to go. And I did this from the day one of my career. My first, first thing when I walked into a bank was go back to behind the teller line. I connected with all the tellers. I connected with all the personal bankers. And then I met with the manager because if you walk in and you go right to the manager, you ignore them. There's no emotional connection. There's no buy-in. There's no um, team um, that you're trying to, to bring together. So I think those are important. Yeah. And actually, I was going to go down that road, which I call culture. Uh, mm -hmm. But before we do, we're going to let that simmer for a moment. And we're going to take a little break and show a little video. Dear Tomorrow, Yesterday was pretty bad. I hope today is better. The world changed overnight. And then it changed again. And I changed too. They say that we're the future, but I don't even know what that means. I know I can't do it alone. Dear Tomorrow, you're my greatest hope and my biggest fear. I be? What role will I play? And how will I get there? I love that video. And, you know, you talk about you just finished talking about emotional connection. Right. So right. whether we're adults or children, um, emotional connection could not be more important today than ever that I can think of in my career. Right. And, and so I love that you went there. And I just want to touch on that for a couple of minutes. You know, talk about how important that is now. What are you seeing how is it helping to get your people through that? Um, and I think one of the words you did not say, but I de definitely heard coming through in that was vulnerability, mm -hmm. right? And so let's, let's talk about that a little bit and how that's getting some of your people through this. Yeah, and you know, Lori, it's, it's, it's definitely been tough and challenging the last year and a half um, with everything that we're going through in this world. And you know, in the banking centers, the banks have been open, you know, maybe our doors were locked, but we still saw customers. And so I think it was a matter of, you know, showing that you care, showing that you need to help them. Um, and, and, you know, they needed us more than ever during this last year and a half. And they continue to need us moving forward because we're, we're still in challenging times right now. And so it's a matter of, you know, me being visible, them knowing that I'm out there to support them, knowing that I'm there to ask or answer their questions. Um, because a lot of them, well, all employees have felt very comfortable through these times reaching out to me directly. 
um, after maybe they talked to their manager, they said, you know, I'd like to talk to Dave. I want to hear what he has to say as well from a different perspective. And so being available, being ready, um, you know, everybody has to be vulnerable. Everybody has to understand what we're going through. We're all going through it together. And we all, we all have to um, bring ourselves as one and support one another because there's challenging times, as I keep saying, you know, we've had employees that had to be on quarantine. And if you have an employee that's on quarantine, now you have less staff to take care of customers in a banking center. So everybody needs to step up and support one another and help one another and be there for each other, whether it's me, whether it's the manager, whether it's just tellers in the banking center. So, um, yeah, I think now more than ever, and that video that you just showed just really speaks to it so well. Yeah, yeah especially for our young people, right? Yeah. Um, and now as we navigate back into schools and the masks, and there's just yeah. so much controversy and politics and everything around it. You know, and my feeling is I don't really care about all that. We need to take care of our young people. And by the way, we need to take care of each other, as you said, and yeah. we need to take care of our seniors. Right. right. I, have a, I have an aging mom. She'd kill me if she heard me say that. But <laughs> um, she said I laugh. I take her to senior community centers um, and she's 85 and she'll be like, I'm not going there. It's too old. I'm like, Mom, you're 85. Yeah, no, I'm not going there. It's too old. <laughs> So, you know, we all have our own mind, in our mind, right? What, right. Where we belong, but right. this really wreaked havoc, I think, on a lot of people. And I think it's so important, you know, and all of that kind of, you know, for me, kind of goes into that one word, you know, of culture. Yes. And I think it's, you know, it's interesting. And I share this all the time. I think it's the hardest part of any leader's job. Mm -hmm. is creating a culture. And I yeah. think in the old days, right, because I've been around a little while, like yeah. you, right, the culture was set by the leader. They told us what the mission was. They told us what the values were. We didn't have any input into it, right? right. This right. is what it was. Today is a very different world, right? And I, I, I love that we give everyone input into defining what that culture is. Mm -hmm. But it's really interesting because there's almost a dichotomy, right? There's like this this push push pull thing, I think that goes on is we want them to be part of building the culture. They want to be part of the culture, but yet sometimes they expect us as C level managers or directors to to create the culture. Right, right. My opinion, and I'd love to hear yours, is that we're all responsible. Yes. for building and maintaining and managing the culture. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and something that, that we do at Comerica is what's called Voice of the Colleague. And we do a survey of all employees, every line of business, every year. We just finished our Voice of the Colleague this year. And it gives all employees an opportunity to give feedback. You know, what do you like? What do you don't like? What are some ideas that you have to build the culture, to build training and development, to what are you missing? What are you looking for? What do you need more of? And so every year when we get the results of that voice of the colleague, and it goes down all the way down to each market, each banking center, and we develop two or three action plans of different areas that maybe are the biggest opportunity that we heard our employees um, talk about and give feedback on. And we create the action plan, but it's not me creating the action plan for the market. It's the employees creating it together as a team because it's not my culture. It's not my action plan. It's the entire team's action plan. And so to, in order to get buy-in and to move the culture forward, you need everybody's buy-in. You need everybody's support. You need everybody's input. And so we create that every year and we make sure that we keep it top of mind throughout the year. And how are we performing against it? How are we improving? Um, because I think it's extremely important um, from a culture standpoint. And, and I think the other piece is, it's something that we always talk about, that we want to make sure from the top of the organization all the way down, and this has been every organization I've worked at, that employees feel free to speak what's on their mind without any negative consequences to them or repercussions. And so employees need to understand, hey, 
tell me what's on your mind. Feel free. There's no good or bad comment or question or anything like that because we want to move forward. We want to support you. And, and so I think, you know, specifically Comerica where I am today, I think it's really important of how they do it with the voice of the colleague, how we create the action plans. And I will tell you the culture here at Comerica is amazing. The bank has been around for 170 years, yeah. started in Michigan. And when you talk to employees in the bank across the country, they have been here for 30 years, 35 years, 40 years. You know, the longevity, people don't leave because of the culture and the support that they get to grow. Mm, yeah, I love that. And kind of what you're talking about is trust, right? Building that trust yes. um, for people. And, and I think also coaching them. Sometimes people have a tough time, even in safe environments, right? Speaking their mind um, right. because of fear or whatever. And so I often ask this question, how can I help people to be bold, to be mm -hmm. courageous, right? Because sometimes it takes courage to speak up. Um, you know, how do we help them and teach them and uh, guide them, right, to be authentic? I call right. that authenticity. Yeah, you have to be. You have to be open, authentic. But I, I think, like you said, it really starts with trust. If you can build the trust and respect of the team, that's first and foremost. And once you have that trust and respect, then everything else falls into place. And, and you had mentioned coaching. And, you know, I think, you know, everybody takes coaching differently. And I have always looked at it, and I try to instill this in, in my team and everybody I work with. Coaching is a gift. And whether it's, um, you know, some, some positive reinforcement or opportunities that, they, that you coach them on to get better, it's a gift. And that's how I look at it. If you look at coaching as a gift, not as a negative, I, I think, and I think you can't coach until you gain that trust and respect. Mm, yeah, that is so true. I, you know, it's so funny. I've had uh, several coaches. Um, and for me, uh, the one that, that stands out is the one that called it like it was, mm -hmm. you know, and would look at me and go like, what? Like, what, what, you know, would call me out basically, not, not disrespectfully. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. But that was the person that I grew from, because right. if even if I didn't agree at the moment, like, well, no, 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 no I don't think that or whatever. Although I'm pretty self-aware um, and I, I stew on when I know I haven't handled something the best way that I could have or, you know, I didn't do anything wrong, but maybe I could have handled it better. I stew on it because mm -hmm. I want to be better. Right. 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 Um, and I'm willing to say I didn't. And sometimes you need to think about it. You don't always get to that at first when you're coaching. Sometimes right. people do get defensive. And all of us, right, uh, get a little bit defensive at first. But hopefully we take the feedback and we think about it and we process it. Mm -hmm. And then we are more open to asking questions and understanding it. And how can I fix that? Or how can I change that? Right. Uh, or how can I grow in that? And that's when someone, you know, we're not perfect. I tell this to my team all the time. There is no such thing as perfect anything. <laughs> right. But I am relentless in yep. the pursuit of making progress, whether it's me individually, whether it's their progress, the organization's progress, because that's all we can do is continue to move forward. Right. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, to, to that point, I, you know, when you have somebody that coaches you and it doesn't feel comfortable, you, like you said, you can't react. You can't react right away. And there's sometimes you have to take that 24 hour rule, as I call it, let it absorb, think about it overnight and then reflect on it. And then you can respond back because if you respond immediately to something that made you feel uncomfortable, you might respond respond in the wrong way and you might regret it. So you really need to take a step back and kind of absorb it and reflect on it. And then I will say in most cases, you say, wow, that really reflecting back, that really helped me grow. And that was really great. It was, it was hard and difficult coaching and feedback, but I grew from it. I learned from it. And, 
and thank you for coaching me in the way that you just did because it really helped me. Because I think sometimes we don't go back to our leaders and we thank them for that difficult or hard coaching. And I think it's important. Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting that you say that. Um, and I, I think I can tell that you do what you do because you love it. I think you can tell. I do what I do because I love it. I don't do it for the gratitude or the pat on the back or any of those things. But it is really interesting because more than more than ever, what I have found is my team reaching out to me and saying, thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks for right. caring about us. Uh, right. And there are times when they're not happy with something, you know, that's okay too. Um, yeah. But I think it's so important. I think sometimes people that we're all leaders, right? I would say that everybody in our organization is a leader. Right. But those at the very top that are ultimately responsible at the end of the day for the, the overarching, right, uh, picture and goal, sometimes it's hard to be, right, in the stands watching the quarterback and calling the plays. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you don't always understand everything. Communication, of course, is so important, but sometimes there just isn't enough communication um, yeah. or you can't communicate for whatever reason. Um, I think it's easy for people to sit back and judge. Yes, yeah. Um, but sometimes, you know, I, I look at that myself and I work on that constantly, not yeah. judging others, including family. I was right. telling a story lately about my daughter wanting to go into the van life. And I'm like, what? The what <laughs> life? And I'm like, oh, this is a phase. It's going to pass. That's crazy idea. Right. And I'm thinking, I never said that to her. And now I did because I told her the truth, how I was thinking. And I said, but I'm open to it. Right. I've been talking to different people. What is this all about? What, right. Don't judge till you get to understand what someone is going through or what they're feeling right. or what they're talking about. Right. Exactly. And, and, and understand, it. understand what they're talking about. Maybe do a little bit of research, maybe talk to some others to, to, to understand it. Um, and, you know, something you touched on, Lori, as well, is where I am today. I never forget how I started in the bank. I never forgot what it was like to be in the trenches, to be a teller, to be a personal banker, to be a branch manager, whatever the position was. Because I think that's really important as a leader. And you know, you, you shouldn't forget because you need to understand and reflect and remember what are these folks going through? Because you were there once. And I think it's so important for them to understand that and know that. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Never forget where you came from, right? Um, <laughs> So one last thing before we read off your recipe for success and ask you for your main ingredient. Comerica has been a, a wonderful supporter of Junior Achievement. And we thank you and we appreciate you uh, for all of that. And we love having your people involved. Uh, and that makes it really special, right? Anybody can write a check. But the fact that your associates are, are passionate about it and get involved in it, Talk a little bit for us before we, we go into the ingredients about community and the importance of having your people involved in the community and giving back. Yeah, you know, it's something that Comerica thrives on, the importance of giving back to the communities that we work and live. And it doesn't matter, you know, so we, we all want to volunteer in the communities and everybody has a passion for different organizations and doing different things. And it doesn't matter what your passion is, as long as, you know, you have that interest to volunteer and give back. And so, you know, at a, at a corporate level with, you had mentioned Mo Corker, our external affairs person, we, we try to help organizations with financial literacy, with um, women and, and women and girls, when we did your, your last event, the Girls Power, um, we help senior citizens, now we're really focused on helping organizations that are doing COVID relief. And, and so whether it's organizations, especially in Florida, whether it's in Broward County, Palm Beach County, or we have a banking center in Naples and Collier County, we are in the community. We are giving back. We are trying to show that we care. Um, and we give a lot of time. I, I can't tell you the, the time that we are doing different workshops to different um, organizations, low to moderate income areas, 
uh, financial literacy programs, small business boot camps for business owners that are just starting a business and under, trying to help them understand how to grow their business. Um, but it's a passion for what we do at Comerica. It's not just here in Florida, but literally it's across the company. And we talk about it every day and we share those across all markets. How are we, how are we helping our communities that we work and live each day um, and share that across the company? So it's really important. We all have a passion for it. Um, I think you see, you could, you could tell by you getting to know me today, you know Mo quite well. It's the passion that we all have. And it's every yeah. organization, quite a few of the organizations out there uh, that really need us and that we care. And like you said, it's not just writing a check, but it's the time that we give back to help them. Yeah, I love it. And I've been watching on social media, some of the stuff you're doing around small businesses, minority businesses. Yep. Um, so it definitely is not going unnoticed. I'm, I'm a big LinkedIn person. And so I see a lot of that. So uh, kudos to all of you and thank you, thank you. for all thank that you do. So let's read back some of your ingredients to success. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I've, I have filled up the entire page and then we're, I'm going to ask you, it could be one of these, or it might be something different, what your main ingredient to success is. So some of the things you mentioned were trying different things, right? Trial and error uh, and learning as much as possible about what you like, what you don't like, what your strengths, what, what aren't. Uh, passion. You mentioned that several times. Breaking out of your comfort zone and trying different things. Again, going back to that, trying different things. Uh, taking calculated risks drive we talked about drive um and i think that's so important especially for our young people uh having a mentor who pushes us right uh, a little bit further than the line we might cross ourselves presentation skills relationship building you talked a lot about that uh learning from different ways that people do things right being open to different perspectives <clears throat> um guiding people um emotionally connecting with your teams and with the community and with your customers, being a mentor, showing people you care, mm -hmm. being visible, knowing uh, and letting others know that you're there to help and to coach and to guide, uh, being vulnerable. Uh, we mentioned, we talked about that for a little while, um, getting input and feedback, right? We can't do it without, we can't learn and grow without feedback. Um, giving back to the community, of course, we just talked about inclusion of the team, in decisions, in direction, in action plans, all of that. Um, and you talked about action plans, right? Planning is so important as your, as a leader, uh, knowing where your team is going, uh, looking at coaching as a gift. I like that one. Um, and the 24 hour rule. Thanks for the reminder on that one. I love that one. Um, and never forget where you came from. Some really, really great ingredients. And I know we, if we kept talking, we would come up with another whole page of ingredients. <laughs> um, so I now get to ask you, Dave Kunick, what is your main ingredient to success? Um, so I think out of all those, it's amazing all the things we talked about and, and hearing the notes that you took. Um, but I think the one thing that has, has taken me through my entire career in order to build a successful team, you have to first gain their trust and respect and have that emotional connection with them. And those are the really the, the key pieces of recipe for success. If you don't gain the trust and respect immediately from the get go and don't have that mo emotional connection, you will not be successful in building a team and moving the needle forward. And so I think that's something that I've always always had in, in me as I move to other lines of business, other opportunities within the bank, that's what you have to do. And, and, um, and it's not just building that trust and respect and emotional connection with your team, but the partners you work with. Right. You have to also build it with partners. Sometimes we forget about that, but it's also the partners. So I think that's really truly my recipe for success over the, the many years in banking that I've been in. Well, that is a pretty delicious recipe, if you ask me. Um, <laughs> and so I, uh, and I know, did you send us a recipe of your own? We do collect recipes from people. So we'll have to make sure okay. we get your recipe because one of these days I'm going to do a cookbook. 
Okay. But it's going to have your food recipe and your leadership re uh, recipe. So we've we've been gathering all that up. So we'll get that from you too. Thank you so much, Dave, for sharing, for being vulnerable, uh, for um, teaching and coaching us this morning. I learn from every single guest that we have on the show. Sometimes I learn new things and sometimes I'm just reminded of things that maybe I knew, but I forgot right? Or haven't been practicing or haven't been conscious about. And so thank you for, um, for bringing some of those things back up uh, for me and sharing your story. No, it's my pleasure, Lori. It's, it's really been an honor and I, I've really enjoyed this time with you and to share some of these things. So um, thank you again. I appreciate it. Uh, and I'm sure we'll be in touch uh, with Junior Achievement. So absolutely. Thank you. And thanks again for your support. And thanks everyone out there who's been watching. Want to do a special shout out to one of our viewers, Roy Rogers. Thank you so much for wishing uh, my family well, my mom in particular. And so I want to just give him a little shout out, uh, a great friend and a great man in this community. So thank you everyone for watching and let's get cooking. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Lori. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.